Rob Schneider is um, an old friend of mine. What I want to ask you, Rob, is are you white? I'm white enough. <laughs> I'm not Asian enough. You know, finally they're hiring people of color and Asians for, for movies, but I'm not Asian enough where it can help me now. You know? Well, how Asian are you? Well, my mother is Filipino. Your so. mother? So you're 50% yeah. Asian? Yes. Yeah, so because I'm trying to get at a proper balance, <laughs> you know, your quota in the yeah. show, and you're helping, but not a the, lot. The only, yeah, the only real benefit I get from Asian is, uh, well, all my eyebrows fell out, for one. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I have that, and uh, some of other genitalia issues. But <laughs> other than that, and, and not, not in, a, in a beneficial way. All right, you silly man. Um, you know all about America, America show business in Hollywood? Yes. Yeah. Well, I don't know all, but I know a few things. Well, you've been, uh, <laughs> been around a long time. I've seen... You've done movies, you, yeah. don't, you do a stand-up, right? Yes, it's been, uh, it's been a fun experience. The best thing, though, I, are the, um, the people that you meet, like yourself, and the people that you look up to, and you, you have uh, opportunities to work with some actors. And sometimes you get a strange phone call, so would you like to go to the Czech Republic? and do a movie with Martin Landau. And the next thing you know, you're in Prague and with the food, I mean, very lovely people and nice place, but the food was terrible. Unless you like it, goose. Oh, I love goose. It's the only reason to go to Prague, apart from <laughs> the architecture. You only get to keep the stories, because you know, the money goes, you know, women go, money goes with the women, you know? Houses go with the women as they go. And uh, the fame can go up and down, whatever. But you get to keep the stories. Ah. Uh -huh. So that's it. So Martin um, was out one night and uh, he was talking about acting. And he said, I, and he was an acting teacher in 1961. He said, the, the thing about acting, he said, you have to find it, express it, and suppress it. You can't tell people nakedly what you want. It has to be filtered. And maybe once in a film, you could do this. And I found that fascinating. So I wrote it down. The next morning comes into the... We're both hungover. He comes into the, uh, the makeup trailer and says, what did I say to you last night? It was the actual perfect summation of acting I've ever heard. And of course, I, I've ever heard, he says. And he said, and I still had the beer card. And I said, yeah. find it, express it, suppress it. He said, oh, I thought it was better than that. Because <laughs> <laughs> he was the guy, Martin Landau, North by Northwest, stepping on the hand of Cary Grant. Cary Grant. And on the top of uh, Mount Rushmore, yeah. Marty was saying, after working a few weeks with Hitchcock and Eva Marie Saint, James Mason and Cary Grant, he finally got the gumption to go, so Hitch, what was it about me that you saw in that Broadway play that made you decide to give me the part for this, this role? And Hitchcock said, well, I thought you make an excellent homosexual. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> so. What I loved about Hitchcock, you know, is that he was regarded as a very ordinary director. People thought he was good, nothing wrong with him, but nothing special about him. And then Francois Truffaut, great yeah. French director, yes, wrote a book critic. about him saying how good he was, and then everybody realised he was a genius. <laughs> but what I loved about him was that he was, it was so simple for him. I mean, somebody uh, said to him once, a journalist said, how long, Mr Hitchcock, can you hold a screen kiss? And Hitchcock said, that all depends whether I can put a bomb under the bed first. <laughs> Why do you play happy music at the start of all your movies? And he says, because people get anxious when it stops. There's something <laughs> so simple about his thinking, you know. Yeah, but it's very effective. Well, it's also a different time where you could set a mood. Yeah. And like, you know, in Fish Called Wanda, you also set that mood for quite a while. You had a confidence about that, where you didn't feel you had to tell a joke or even get think about the joke for about an, an extraordinary amount of time today. You're absolutely right, and it's because somebody once said many, many years ago, they said, if you're doing a farce, you should have no laughs in the first 20 minutes. It should all be absolutely dead serious. But if you do that, people get uncomfortable. So you have to yeah. put a few little jokes in. But the main, if you're doing that kind of farcical comedy, right at the start, you've got to make absolutely sure that all the premises, all the fundamental ideas yeah. of the movie, 
movie are established and then you can run because you never have to establish anything yeah. else again so nothing ever holds up the pace there's suddenly a description of the plot in the middle or explanation of the well, plot no good that kills it it did have a furious uh it was it did have a furious pace to it after a while yeah you just it just runs and then that was the the so but you try to get to that point where the audience is just rolling laughing. Yeah, That's what the, the point wonderful. is. It's wonderful. If you could, once you get the audience laughing, yeah. it's easier to keep them laughing than <laughs> yeah. it is to make them laugh in the first place. That's know? an interesting thing. The, you know, we killed a man. Did I tell you that? No. Kevin Klein and I killed a man in Denmark. He was a dentist. He had a, he had a, um, a, 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 a huge laugh, a famous laugh. Yeah. Very popular. Is an orhus. Uh, not a big time, but everybody knew him. And he went yeah. to see uh, uh, Wanda and he started laughing about two minutes in and never stopped. They carried him out dead. He had a heart attack. <laughs> and I, I told well. Kevin this and Kevin said, exactly which scene. <laughs> <laughs> I do love that. Was it uh, the 7.30 show or the 9.30? <laughs> It is a, a different time now where you have to feel like Brando taught one acting class in um, in Los Angeles in the early 90s and he came dressed as a woman and my friend John Lovitz was there and, he, and I said, you have to tell me about that. And he said, why didn't you, I would have loved to have come to that. And he said, well, it's John Lovitz. John Lovitz who also talks like this. And he says, well, he came in and, and Marlon started talking and he said, you have to give the audience a reason to stop eating their popcorn. <laughs> he said, you gotta give, no, no, John, John, you have to give the audience, you gotta do something, something crazy so that they can just go and stop. <laughs> and today, I think it's, you have to give the audience a reason to stop looking at their phone. Yeah, yeah. They're so addicted Have you to ever it. performed in Dubai? <laughs> no. Oh, it's very strange because you look at the audience and you only see the top of their heads because they're all doing this. I know. I've never seen that before. Is it a multitasking? So they are listening because they did come to the show and they did I pay. don't know. I think they just came to the show to say they'd been to the show and they were getting on with some important <laughs> business. Uh, Was that the second show or the first show? <laughs> first show. Because <laughs> I do think that, like, I did see uh, Louis C.K. on a Sunday oh. and the audience was fabulously... Uh, alive and electric and everything. And then, and it was one of the, you know, a brilliant show, as he is brilliant. And then I came back Monday and I, and it, it was great, but not quite as good. Uh, and I said, uh, I said, it's an amazing show, but not like last night. And he said, I know, I knew that was gonna happen because the fans will come to that first show because that they get the tickets and then it's gone. And then the other people who come go, they heard about it. Well, maybe it'll be a good idea to go. Yeah, and I thought those absolutely. are the guys on their phone. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's right. But the great thing about stage shows is you don't offend anyone. Well, though you would think so, but there's, um, I found it to be a very unique thing recently that has happened in the past, whether it was with Lenny Bruce or uh, in the 60s, or, and I remember, um, you know, the, the screamer comedian, um, Sam Kennison. And Sam Kennison, oh. who would have uh, a very unique way of uh, delivering lines by screaming at the audience, you know, like, you know, he had an idea about like these um, people starving in Africa. And he said, I've got an idea, move to where the food is. <laughs> and I just hadn't seen anybody at a full out screaming at an audience. It's interesting how the idea of stand up grew. Because when I was young, there was no stand up. Well, there wasn't, and as a matter of fact, I mean, Jerry Seinfeld said this thing, which I, th I agree with, he said, in 1975, there were 40 comedians and eight of them were good. <laughs> in, in 1985, there were 4,000 comedians and eight of them were good. <laughs> and I think it's true. He told me not to go to the universities. I got an early, an early uh, yeah. warning of that. He said, don't go because they're looking to be offended. And Chris Rock said that to me yeah. as, as well. And he, we just, you, you don't go to those anymore. So I do think though, I've had people come to the show that I think specifically want, like with Sam Kennison, I saw people who had paid to see him yeah. to get up and walk out. <laughs> as if to make a statement. Really? Yeah. I thought the whole point of that was that they, if, they, if they hate you, they don't buy tickets. So yeah. the audience is pre 
selected to like what you do. So I, I think, think so. have people walking out. But the, I think you do, though. I think in the 1970s, a very interesting feature uh, for uh, society and for individual communication between people <laughs> and friends was, don't be so uptight. It's just, yeah, right, don't be so yeah, uptight. Yeah. And now it's, how uptight can you get? Yeah. I think you can get more uptight. I think you should be offended by that, because I am. <laughs> yes. how, you're not offended. I'm offended that you're offended. I'm offended that you're not offended that I'm offended that you're not offended. <laughs> you know, and I do think that that is um, in play. I don't know where it's going to go. But the interesting thing is, in the old days, you offended people on the right. Yes. Right? Yeah, absolutely. They were the old uh, sort of soldiers and all those kind yeah. of people, or the, the ones who were very, very historic in, in their kind of uh, orientation. Yeah. They were the ones who walked out. I remember Peter Cook telling me when he had a club here called The Establishment, yeah. and he was doing a show one day, and he finally made a joke about cancer, and there was a table, and the man got up and said, right, that's it, cancer, <laughs> out, everyone, and their family all left like that. Wow. He was waiting for that. Now most of the offence is on the left. It is true. I, I think that you have the offense, to, to be honest, I think it's like they're both at their extremes, back to back, thinking and being the same way. Whether it's the left, you're here, and they're complaining about something, and it's not too far removed from the right on this side complaining, but they are back to back and complaining. But I do think the left is, it's coming from a place of, um, it's an intolerance, but it's dressed up as manners. Uh, yes, it's as, certainly uh, intolerant, because what I... What I think I, I don't understand about them is, do, do they have, genuine, do they have a sense of humor? I think so, but I think it's uh, intellectualized to where they, they, can't, they, they can't find themselves laughing. It has to be okayed because it could look badly upon them. If they did laugh. Yeah, there's this kind of, oh, well, yeah. as, uh, as our good friend Andrew Doyle talks about it, there's this, this certain uh, righteousness about it that it has to be, and as it's a, you know, it, it is very much a fundamentalist form of thinking. It's a closed system of thought. Yeah, that's right. You, if you, if you um, step outside of that, then you're a heretic and you're, you're outside the system. And so I think that they desperately want to be in, in that ideology, no matter how crazy it gets, no matter how lunacy it gets. And it starts off with a very good idea. Yes. Which is, let's be kind to people. Right. Right. Well, yes, and it, well, the, as a matter of fact, I mean, who wouldn't want to be anti-fascist? I mean, they sure dress it up nicely, don't they? It's like, <laughs> you don't want to be an anti, who is an anti-fascist? I'm, I'm, I'm anti-fascist, who would, who's for Hitler? I mean, who was, <laughs> you know, right. and it's like, who isn't? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, the, um, the woke I idea, and who's, it seems like it's, it's, it's social justice. Who is, who's against, are you against social justice? No, I am not, why would I be? But it's interesting, because for someone who's of a mixed race, I think, well, how, if I, my white part is suppressing my Asian part, <laughs> how much and where? <laughs> Look, there's two types of teasing. There's nasty teasing. Yeah. And then there's affectionate teasing. Like you and me, when we see each other, it's a barrage yeah. of insults. And it's yes. a kind of compliment, because what I'm saying to you is, you know that I love you, so I can yeah. say these terrible things to you, but <laughs> yeah. it's proof that I love you, because I'd never say them to you if I didn't. Right, it exactly. Would be rude. It yes. would be. And as a matter of fact, it's that kind of affection that says, I, I trust you, and yes. I trust you that I can be me, yes. and that there's no harm intentions. That's there's nothing it. harm intent. But I, I like with my wife, who's Mexican, I can tell the audience jokes, and sometimes... They get so concerned that it's, a, it's as if they need to protect these all Mexicans who can't fend for themselves. Yes. They are, they're so weak. That's right. Because <laughs> you know? I sometimes do jokes, you know, I do jokes about the French. Why do the French have so many civil wars? It's so they can win one now and again. <laughs> yeah. you know, how many men does it take to defend Paris? We don't know. It's never been tried. <laughs> <clears throat> how can you tell that a Bulgarian plane has landed at the airport? Because it has hair under both wings. <laughs> Everyone is laughing, yeah. you know? And, yeah. and uh, see, the point is we don't mean we hate them. Right, We're just yeah. making jokes. There used to be books at Dalton bookstores. Yeah. There's old bookstores in the, in the, where there's a chain in the States. And there was a rack right by the cash register with Polish jokes, Italian jokes, <laughs> blah, you know. And then it, it just, it was something you can just laugh at. My joke with my wife is, my wife's Mexican and, you know, and I talk about how we moved to Arizona to be slightly freer than it was in California. 
And then... Uh, what do you mean, cheaper? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Freer for the wallet. And then we so my wife, are you happy now? We're in the desert. You happy? <laughs> she said, there's cactus in the backyard. <laughs> and coyote. Not the kind that brought me to this country either. Real coyotes that eat your pets. <laughs> and then... And then I say this joke, and sometimes it gets a, uh, sometimes they're uncomfortable. I said, my wife, the first week, and it's a true story, the first week my wife, we, we were in uh, Arizona, she got stung by a scorpion. But, <gasps> I said, but luckily she's Mexican. The scorpion what? was, what do you mean the, by that? the scorpion was throwing up for hours. <laughs> <laughs> a scorpion. <laughs> we had to take the scorpion to the hospital, get his stomach pumped, and he would not come back to the house, so we had the whole place sprayed for Mexicans. The Rob Schneider, big name, has yeah. been in a lot of major, major films. I first saw him in Juice Bigelow, Male Gigolo. Right. Is that a film you've seen? No, and uh, I'm a little bit too old to remember Rob Sch Schneider because he came in in the like, like 1980s. But he was in Saturday Night Live and all of those sort of things. I stopped watching that. I watched the first five years of it and then I stopped watching it. Did you do, do you do any research into our guests? No, I didn't no. do any research into the guests. Why should I do any research? I knew my role. The amount of money you're paying me, you didn't say you to me. You should be even... showing more of an interest in your work. No, I didn't know what I was going to be doing. Because it's drinks. Because otherwise you're like just one of the cats on set doing yeah. things, just roaming around. Well, did... Did I speak to the guy? Did you let me talk to the guys? Yeah, yeah. well... Did, did you let me... You cut the one interaction I had with Rob Schneider. The problem is that when you are allowed to... When you talk to the guests, it yeah. makes us look bad. How does it make you look because bad? Because you will doubtless say something offensive. And then I'm going to have to apologise for you. You don't know what you say is offensive. We even have yeah. a code word, don't we? Whenever you say something that, that goes too far, what's the yeah. code word? Cabbage. Cabbage. So, you know, the fact cabbage. that I had to say cabbage on set a number of times yeah. should tell you something. Because, but that's... It's like our safe word. But that, but the key thing is, you know you're hitting greatness when you cross the line ever so slightly. Which you do a lot. Yeah, I don't think I'm crossing the line. I mean, he's... You're a very different kind of entertainer than Rob Schneider, though, because a lot of Rob's films are uh, um, knockabout, anarchic, uh, they're really funny. Yeah. Yours, <laughs> you we haven't made... You are in films, <laughs> sorry, I can't do <laughs> I am in films. <laughs> you appear in I am in a supporting artist. Supporting artist, I'm but sorry. But I have I had it. relatively large roles in some of these well, films. Well, you had a line in Wonder Woman, didn't you? I had a line what, in Wonder Woman. What was Woman. the line? Uh, we have to see the president, something like you that. You do that very well. I did I it was very, convinced. Did it, but people notice it. Whatever yeah. it is, don't belittle yeah. me, Andrew. I'm being sincere. These people don't know. No, I'm being sincere. You're interpreting me okay. and belittling you. I'm not. So I have been I'm, on... I'm impressed. I'm, I'm not listening to you. But you're a very different type of comedian than Rob Schneider, because Rob is funny, that's it. Do you know what I mean? Like, just so poles apart. We are poles apart. Yeah. He, is, he is a real comedian. And uh, <laughs> he, he tells jokes. He, he, was, he was amazing when we had dinner with him before the show. Yes. And him, he, he just regaled us. He's one of those regalers. He's one of those naturally funny I don't people. remember any interactions that I have. I'm not going to remember us being together. I don't remember being with John Cleese. This is the worst thing for me. You're I don't not remember. an anecdotalist. I'm not an anecdotalist. I don't no. care about things that happened to me. But Rob, he remembers, he remembers, and Robert yeah. De Niro told me this story. That's great. And, and, and he's a really good stand-up. I've seen him before many times. He's really, really good. He is a really good stand-up, and he's a real... You should come to the UK more often. No. Because I think, no, I think a lot of American humour doesn't translate, but I think his really does. He would make it translate. Real professionals make it yeah. translate. The ones who are not good, the real, the real ones can perform for anybody, anywhere, anytime. But I, I'm... I'm sui genre. How do you pronounce that? Sui genre. I think, genre. I think you're doing well. Yeah. I think just how you're doing it is fine. I'm, I am, I'm only comfortable, I'm like a pastrami sandwich. I'm only comfortable in the back seat of a taxi. I'm not comfortable, I don't know what that means. I don't know what it means either. The Dinosaur Hour, with me, John Cleese, on GB News. Tired of the usual focus tested pre prepared Westminster runaround? Well, so am I. So you want higher taxes? Is your department to blame for this? Are you rethinking this policy? Every Sunday at 9 30, I'll be sitting down with those in power to get the truth about the issues affecting you. Let's be honest, we've known about the cost pressures of this project for years, not months. That's the Camilla Tomini Show, a politics show with personality. On GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel.
you could be offended about anything. Of course you could. But, you could, it, but the people, people with a sense of humor have a kind of sense of proportion. Yeah. And they also understand context. For example, in, uh, let's say, um, Fish Called Wanda, yeah. there you have um, dogs being killed. Yes. You remember one is oh, yeah. uh, run over and one is uh, the other, other dog, big dog eats it, and then um, yeah. another one gets flattened by a huge concrete block. <laughs> and there are the audience, because they sit there, they, that is hysteria. Screaming funny. Screaming funny, killing dogs. Yes. So, <laughs> It's because, about the context that well, we're not really killing dogs, but no. it's the idea that's Yes, funny. the idea, but it's also you have this wonderful technique, which is you are also, you're not just seeing the killing of dogs, you're seeing the result of a person's reaction to the killing of dogs. That's right. Now, that's what we laugh at. That's right. Do you know the other reason I got away with it? What was that? The dogs were Yorkshire Terriers. <laughs> <laughs> if I... <laughs> if you if had, I killed, had been yeah, right. killing... German Gold, shepherds. Or golden retrievers. I would not be here today. <laughs> <laughs> a beautiful golden retriever just yelled at me. But you're yeah. right. There's something uh, killable about those dogs, isn't it? <laughs> it's the yappiness of them. That's it. Yeah. But you're right, though. It is that, that intangible. Like, what can... It's, it's making that choice to have the, the small dogs and the little lady. Those little choices are critical. Yeah. Because, but, yeah but how do you... The thing about it is, like, it's... Part of it's instinctual, like, oh, that would be funny, but then you have to also sit back, calm down, and have the presence of mind to make those critical decisions. Mm. And you've been able to do that. I spent about 10 days, I got the idea that Michael Palin killed these dogs, <laughs> and I took about 10 days, I'm not kidding you, to yeah. think, well, we get away with it. Yeah. You know, and one day, right at the beginning, Charlie Crichton, this wonderful old guy, he was yeah. 77 during the shooting of the film, he had a black sense of humor. And he actually got a bucket of innards from the local butcher. Yeah. And at one point, he got this little flattened um, raffia mat dog yeah. and put <laughs> gizzards, <laughs> kidneys, <laughs> and blood all around it. And it was a disaster oh, yeah, because yeah. the moment that the audience was roaring with laughter at the dog being yes. run over, and then you cut to this and then went, Ugh! and they right. stopped immediately because suddenly it was a real dead dog. Yes, you're And you, you right. can't laugh at that, but you can laugh at the idea of it. Like when you watch a Tom and Jerry, the cat is run over by a steamroller. People yeah. don't say, I can't laugh at that because how, how, how that poor cat must be suffering, you know? Right, yeah. So you can put, get the context right. But it strikes me with a lot of people that they don't understand that the context matters, which is well, why they does. don't understand irony. Well, but the idea is to surprise the audience and get yeah. them to... But they have to be a co-conspirator. They go have on, to, go on. They have to be like, well, like I remember going back to Martin Landau. He says, if you do too much, if you start to reveal too much, the audience backs away because they have to do that part. They have to do their part. And if you make a joke too obvious, yeah, and they see it coming, then they don't laugh so much. But if you surprise right. them because they have to make a little jump in their <laughs> yeah. understanding, then you get the big laugh. There was a, yeah. in, the, in my movie, uh, well, it's, I don't, you couldn't put it in the same conversation as, as a fish called Wanda, but in Deuce Bigelow, the thing that made me laugh so much was a guy who goes into the bathroom, All he's right. washing his hands, and there's always a bathroom attendant, you know? Which I always find a very odd job to go like, you know, you know what I want to do one day? I know what I can do. I can work at a men's urinal. That's what I can do. And I'll get tips, and it'll be fun, and there'll be mints, and there'll be little things they can put, you know, they can have gum and chiclets, and I've got it. So where do I go to school for that? So uh, I go to wash my hands, and there's no, there's a, you know, the guy stands there, puts the soap, you know, when he turns, he turns on the faucet for you, uh, you know? Oh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So They turn right. on the faucet, right? They give yeah. you the soap. You're washing the hands, you know, and then the next thing, uh, so, and then he gives you the towel. And I just thought it'd be fun if I turn to go, after all that, to go, you know, Dad, I've got a question. <laughs> <laughs> and I just thought that, and then they You could, had lip there? No, 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 that was the, it was in the script. That was in the script. That's we, very good. We, and then you, you have a scene with the dad getting advice. And then you have, of course, very much like, you know, in my mind, I was thinking of, why, in the cheese shop scene, you have the uh, the harp 
the, uh, the player. <laughs> it's just it's just another thing to annoy the audience and annoy him, and they get to see how annoyed you are as this stuff is going on, and you're pretending you know it doesn't bother you. And then you they first. forget about it, and <laughs> yeah. then you shout at them. Yeah. Yeah. So. But we, if if that, but uh, they are, it's only funny if you shout at them after <laughs> they've forgotten about it because yeah. they got um, what's the word a custom. They it. have, and then but they it's still there, and they they well it must be for some reason, but then they do forget about it. They must the harp must be there for some reason, but then they forget about it, yeah. and the next thing you know, it's there, and so it's like oh, it's another slap, so that they don't expect. But, it's hard, isn't yeah. it? Because I used, when I was younger, I used to laugh to, till it hurt. Yeah. You know? You remember yes. that when you're 15 yes. or 16? You laugh. At, I, you know, I had that recently? Watching the coronation. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I wasn't going to so watch it. My <laughs> wife was there, and she always watches television in bed with yeah. lots of cats around. <laughs> and she said, come on in. And I came in, and I, I, I sort of lay on the bed a bit like this and yeah. watched the television from not very, very close, and suddenly I thought it was a python sketch. <laughs> <laughs> People in very silly costumes <laughs> yeah, and taking that, something with hats. seriously. <laughs> yeah. I laughed till I hurt. I thought I hadn't, I hadn't done that for about 30 years. <laughs> yeah, that's... I'm glad that I wasn't actually uh, in the cathedral. <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> As the next person comes. <laughs> ah! <laughs> well, it's, it's the hats, and it's, and it's very silly for a man in the 70s is wearing a gigantic popcorn. <laughs> it looks like a popcorn, a jeweled <laughs> popcorn cup. It's you so know? funny, is it? And of course, again, I mean, some people were very touched by it. And yeah. Bless them, because yeah. they think of the tradition and all that. And then naughty people like me just think it's funny. <laughs> <laughs> That's one of the dangers, isn't it? If you've got a sense of humor, you know. Well, the, the, you have at any time, um, you could look at something and find it funny, and it's something out of the ordinary, uh, and certainly something that other people don't find funny. Is is a wonderful thing when you are not allowed to laugh. Oh, oh, like it's the sweetest laughter of all, isn't it? In <laughs> yeah. church. Yes, in church. I had a friend, all right, a dear man, no longer with us, Nicky Henson, and he and his mother were going to a funeral, and she arrived with a brightly coloured hat, and he said, "Why are you wearing that?" And she said, "Well, uh, he said it's all flowers, it's all wrong." <laughs> And she said, well, I'm going on to a wedding. And he said, take it off, take it off. And they put it and they hid it in the vestibule, you know? And the next time they saw the hat is when the coffin came down the aisle, the hat was <laughs> on the <top. laughs> That's wonderful. And they, could, they couldn't say, can we just stop it for a moment? But it's, it's a, it was wonderful moments. That... But the sweetest <laughs> laughter is when you're not supposed to. And that's yeah. why it's so funny on stage. Yeah. When something goes completely wrong <laughs> and you're not supposed to break up. No, you're not supposed to. But the um, the idea of the audience being in conspiratorial uh, on some kind of accident is wonderful. But you can't give right, into it. You, you know? can't enjoy yourself more. Than, I don't like people laughing at themselves when they're on stage. It does happen. Oh, yeah, and it shouldn't. Yeah. No, it shouldn't. You can't be enjoying it more than the audience. No, but you're right. There's a moment when uh, the audience has got to make a slight jump before they get the joke. Yeah. And if you don't let them make the jump, if you if you spell it out too much so yeah. that they see what's coming, then they don't laugh. Yeah, and it's... all the people who write about humour yeah. never write about timing. Right. Right? Exactly. They always talk about content, but not about timing. Which means you could destroy anything by of that way. Of course you can. You could look at anything and go, ah, it's about cheese. That's right. How damn Yeah. Hey, can you imagine hearing different cheeses? And that, that's what we were, that, that's what we had to live through for several minutes, hearing different cheeses. Uh, who thought that was fun? And you can go, you could read that and go, this is awful. Oh, but yeah. then you see this, the, the sketch and, and it's just, Well, when, when we were writing it, I yeah. had cold feet. Uh, well, uh, I, I mean, that's we, we knew what it was about. We knew yeah. he goes in the hospital and he just, it was something my father noticed, which was they never say we don't have that. There's always an excuse, you know. They don't say we don't have that, uh, uh, you know. They say we don't have it on a Thursday, or, you know, or the yeah. van broke down, yeah. or the cat ate it, uh, that yeah. sort of thing. We can't so have it today. We were writing have... all these names and cheeses and then coming up with the responses, and I kept saying to Chapman, is this funny? And he goes, yep, it's funny. Oh, a little wow. bit more, and I'd say... Sure, this is funny. <laughs> I, 
asked him about it four times and he just said, it's funny, it's funny. And then we had a script meeting and we all sat around the table That's and I read it out. It? That's the most frightening part. Performing oh, for other performers. Terrible. For, uh, for especially comedians. Oh. Because they can love it. Comedy writers. Oh, it's the worst. So it was, um, it didn't go very well. For about the first 30 seconds, there was complete silence. And I thought, I was right. Chapman was wrong. Oh, God, this is embarrassing. And yeah. then I heard a giggling. <laughs> Palin. <laughs> Michael Palin, and he completely lost it. <laughs> I've, I've never seen him laugh like that. Yeah. He laughed so much, he fell on the floor. He was lying on the <laughs> floor. <laughs> I looked at Chapman and I said, you were right. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the thing, sometimes it's, it's wonderful to get, um, to get those wonderful giggles. Like Adam Sandler and Rob Smigel on Saturday Night Live, they came up to me, it was about two o'clock in the morning, you know, you know, after a while, when your the structural side of your brain yeah. gets tired, and then you get goofy for it's a, it's a short time before the structural side says stop that, stop being silly, and it comes back, especially late at night or early in the morning. Well, your creative brain, your your uh, your right brain, right side of your brain is 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 just playful and having fun before you've had coffee and the and the structural side break up. So this is one of those times where it was very silly. They came in with this script on Saturday Night Live, a sketch, that they couldn't talk anymore. They were like <laughs> They literally just handed it to me and they were just giggling and falling on the floor. And I read it right in front of them and it was about these Italian waiters at a restaurant that Adam Sandler and I took our girlfriends to. He just took it, because they were very kissy with our, our, our and affectionate. Overly affectionate with our girlfriends. Like, bellissima, yeah, bellissima, yeah. bellissima, oh, bellissima, bellissima, oh, bellissima, bellissima. And so it, he, they wrote this extension where eventually one of the waiters has, has uh, uh, Dana Carvey has uh, Victoria Jackson yeah. and they're having sex on one of the tables. But you see it, you kind of see, you know, the, <laughs> but it, her legs are up in the air. <laughs> I read this and, I, and they, they weren't sure either. But, they, but then they saw me laughing so hard, I fell onto the floor laughing. And they said, we got it. And that was oh, wonderful. And we had a, an actress, Kirstie Alley, who played the, yeah. and she was she just, is. yeah, but she had such a wonderful sense of humor. And uh, I would use, you're not, you don't hear the word broad anymore. No, it's a shame, isn't it? It's it was a, a good old slang <laughs> word. It was, for like a, a tougher woman who was like one of, one of the guys, a yeah, broad. A broad. And she was abroad. Yeah. So that was a lovely. And, and, and you remember those ones when you're scared. Go on. Well, you remember the ones where you're scared. Maybe this isn't funny. Oh, Maybe yeah. This is too oh, much, all the know. time. I still can't tell. If, I don't think I can write something that I think is funny that will get no response. Yeah. But I can't tell whether it will get a bigger or small response. Yeah. I just know it will be a bit funny, but it might be hugely funny. And you never know until you get in front of the audience. You don't know. And, and actually, you should never try it out before that. I find... How do you mean? Well, don't tell your wife the joke before you try oh, no, it on stage. Because no, no, no. then, like, I found myself a joke that I just thought could be great. And I told my... I said, couldn't wait to get it on stage. And I told my wife, and she didn't laugh, and I never did the joke. So maybe I, I just lost complete confidence well, in it. You can, and you can lose confidence like yes. that, you know? Yeah. I always think how terrible it must be being a sportsman. Yeah. You know, and you miss an open goal or something like that, or you blow your service game in yeah. a more important match. You miss a free because throw. So, well, yeah, yeah, right. It's so awful, that feeling. And that's why we talk about dying. Actors don't yes, die. Yeah. Comedians die, because yeah. the feeling... When you tell a joke and you get nothing, it's well, just... Feel... Camilla, my daughter, says yeah. it's like being a matador. And I said, what are you talking about? Are you talking about? She said, you get such an immediate response. <laughs> <laughs> she's brilliant. Yeah, she's that clever. is Her material is brilliant. Rob, c can you help me? Yes, sir. Can you take me back to America with you? <laughs> well, I, seem to, I don't know if you can fit in my bag, but... Well, I can see what I can do. What is All going right. on? No, it's okay. I just wanted to see if Rob wanted something else to drink. It's interesting talking to Rob, an American comic, coming to the UK. Yeah, yeah. There is a difference 
with American humor and British humor, but you've experienced both because you were on the New York comedy scene. Yeah. Then you came to the UK, and for some reason you stayed. For some reason I stayed. I wanted to see my children. Oh, it was because Basically, family Basically, yeah. yeah okay. I mean, I would have gone home if I didn't have any children because I was, uh, they, they liked me initially a little bit and then they turned on me. What, the children or the audience? Everybody. <laughs> Everybody. Everybody. This is, this is uh, British people think they're the funniest people on earth and you're not, you're not funny, as you can tell. He's not funny trying to be funny. I'm not trying to be funny. You are, you're trying to be funny, you can see. Here's, here's, <laughs> sorry about this, Andrew. That's all right. Is that, is that, I think with Americans, we Americans like to be loved. Is that right? And English people don't want to be loved. Do you know what that is true? I notice that with American comedians. There's a lot yeah. more sense of like me, like me. You know, yeah. like uh, they're a lot more bubbly. Whereas a lot of uh, British comedians are almost uh, standoffish. Yeah. Well, like I was thinking for laughing at. Them. I was thinking more of the audience. Is that the audience in this country? If you tell the audience, "Oh my God, I love England. What a great country! Your castles. You, yeah. You're great people. You're so much more spiritual. You're so much more." The audiences don't like it. But if you go to America and you say, "America, you know, you." People. Well, look, I've performed in America not much, just a few times. Yeah. The audiences are very, uh, uh, how would you put it, uh, vocal. Yeah. Very volu I mean, they cheer at anything, and they laugh at anything. Yeah, because they paid money, they want to enjoy themselves. You so people, it's capitalist. Are that's what it is. It's it's you pay. I don't know. That's it's not just, the right word. No, it's it's not it's capitalist. A... You pay money. You're going to get your money's worth. I don't think Americans are going to get their money's worth. I love that you can psychoanalyze an entire I've nation. I've thought about. It. I've been here for 23 years yeah. already. I've had too much of you people. What I do is I do with you right now is we're sitting here talking about this, and if something's funny, I might write down it later and repeat it. Yeah. It's, it, it's not like I, th I think, oh, I'm going to say that to Andrew. That's going to be funny. So I don't think that way. John Cleese and these other people sit down and think, oh, this would make a nice painting, yeah. or this could be a good story, or this could be a good sketch. Well, that was interesting. It's clear that it is a kind of vocation that for an artist, a true artist, I don't think you could do anything else. Not because you're incompetent, yeah. although there is an element of that, but more that you, you, know, you, you need to be a comedian, you need to be a performer. Something inside you, you know, is screaming out for attention. No. No, I could do lots of things. I've done other things, and I've done other things well. I sold advertising space, I was an estate agent. Were you? Yeah, I did lots of other things. It's this this. Yeah, myth. but you didn't end up doing that. You didn't end up as an estate agent. No, lady. because my father left me some money and I didn't need to. <laughs> it's, it's so interesting because I, I, it really, it just, it bothers me thinking about it because I don't do what that, I should do what that is. I should read Adam Bloom's book. I should read. Yeah, but you don't, no, well. I should learn. I should sit down at a desk and write out jokes. I can't do that. Like you, like you say, my, my show, what, what is my show? My show is, I've done, you do your show so many times yeah. that eventually you say the same things over and over again. People laugh and you, you don't realize well, that, is a, that is a kind of craft in of itself. It that is, is a, a craft. Kind of, yeah, yeah. The Dinosaur Hour with me, John Cleese, on GB News. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11 a.m. on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Rob, I want to ask you, because you go out there on new stand-up all the time, what effect is woke having on you? The woke principles of being so careful about everything. Yes. Um, well, it's uh, been a nice conversation, but I, 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 don't, I don't think I can talk. I don't want to get in trouble. I don't want to keep my... No. It's, um, why, why do we get in trouble if we disagree with them? There is a group of people, and there's not as many of them as you think, but they, they have... What they do is there's a, a few people that claim to uh, self-righteousness. They are, they are so pure in their thinking. Yes. They would never deign to laugh at something that, was, uh, that, that, that they thought was making fun of they, people they think are inferior to them. They would never want to do that because they are here and they're... So they, 
They feel the people they're protecting, these inferiors. Oh, so protection of other groups becomes condescending. I think that's I think true. So, yeah, well, absolutely, yeah. I think it's true. And, but it's also a, a thing of, of a, a weird form of elitism. I think there's always a sneaky thing of, I am better than you. I have, I have higher thinking than you. I laugh at more uh, things that don't, uh, you know. But it's purity, purity. Yeah. When people think they're pure, don't forget that was a problem with the Nazis. When they think that yeah. they're pure, mm -hmm. then they kind of can't admit to any negative emotions in themselves, which is what unfortunately human beings have all the time. But because yeah. they can't add up, uh, admit to their own, what they do is denial and projection. You know, this Carl Jung's idea that they, they deny the emotions in themselves. They haven't gone away, so they start seeing them in other people. So if they're very aggressive, but they can't admit their aggression to themselves, they see the aggression in the other people, which then justifies them being aggressive towards the aggressive people over there. Wow. No, I know. that makes... It's, a, it's an old principle. If you go back to this fellow with the same initials as me, um, Jesus Christ, yeah. um, he, he uh, tells the, the moat and beam thing, you know, why are you um, worried about the um, speck of dust in someone else's eye when you've got a beam in your own eye? So yeah. that pr denial and projection has been going on for 2,000 years. I do think it's... Uh, this one seems like it's here to stay for a while. Uh, I do think it's uh, um, it's unfortunate because what it does is it it the most dangerous form of censorship is self censorship, so it causes people to to restrain what they think, and I think that's not we want everybody we want the best ideas from everyone, yes. and I think if, when you silence people and they're in fear of you, anytime there's got fear in any agenda. And I think this uh, woke agenda is to scare people. They seem a bit, a bit what's the word, totalitarian, don't they? <laughs> yeah. You know? It is. It's a, a closed system of thought. Well, fundamentalism, which is, means this is the way the world is, and that's yeah. the way it is, and that's the way I want to keep it. So don't you challenge it for me. I, 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 I want to say sometimes that, that people who don't have much of a sense of humor should not be in charge of deciding <laughs> what people with a sense of humor can enjoy. Yeah, it's the context, and it has to also do with the, if, is there any real mal intent? Are you there That's to right. hurt anybody? Yeah. And if you're not, I think it's all open. Yeah. If you know that I don't have uh, a, a bad bone in my body, if you sense that, then if I say horrible things, there's a chance that you can laugh at it without worrying about it. Because it's obviously not serious. Yeah. But I think they have a great dif d deal of difficulty with that. You know, it's a funny, there's a difference between solemn and seriousness. Solemn and serious. Yeah. And one is as solemn as no smiling, you know what I mean? Yeah. At coronations, <laughs> you don't put whoopee cushions around them, you know? <laughs> you just treat the whole thing solemnly. You serious, like you and me now, it's a serious conversation, but we're laughing a lot. Yes. And they cannot understand you can laugh and be serious at the same time. Right. That, that's a lovely way to say it. You're being very kind. I do think that it's also a way to just crush dissent by, I think, he, the, the political nature of it is anyone who disagrees with, we can not only not laugh at, we can destroy. Their career. And, and, and no, because they, um, it's like a brownie point for them. If they can take something and say, wow, we hurt that guy, we got his... Yes. We found something 10 years ago. My interesting thing is what they do now is they're running out of people to cancel, so they're canceling dead people. <laughs> they'll, 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 they'll what find, do you mean? Well, they'll find something John Wayne said in 1972 at a graduation ceremony at USC, and they go, He's, here's what John Wayne said. I mean, that's that's... You have yeah. people, bloggers, it's, it's not the news anymore. It's somebody going, I can make $50 if I sell this article to Buzz or whatever. Yeah. And, then, and, then, and so you, you have a kind of a race to the bottom and who can destroy what and who gets a little brownie point. And it's, it's just a... It is about that warm glow of satisfaction. <laughs> you know I've mean? heard someone. Yeah. I that is a mouth. Really that... put them in their place because they're such bad people. <laughs> yes. But I don't hate them. I'm doing it for their own good. <laughs> you know? And also the idea that you have to protect other people. For example, yeah. I have a Mexican joke, which I yeah. like. But what I like about it is that it's not putting the Mexicans down. <laughs> it's kind of, it's a cheery joke. You know, it's a yeah. Gulf of Mexico 
um, uh, a boat, a naval boat, a U.S. naval boat, and yeah. they, they, well, they're just going around. What's going, what, what is that over there? It's two little Mexicans roaring like hell towards <laughs> Americans. And they, yeah. they say, hey, guys, what's happening in the Mexican? I can't do the accent. But the, the Mexicans say, well, well, we're invading America. You say, what? Just the two of you? And he said, oh, no, we're the last ones. The others are already there. Said, now, that's a friendly joke. It's lovely. It's good for them. And know? everybody can relate to it. Because they Mexicans are great people. They have a sense of humour. Yes. And there's so many stereotyping. You know, there's a, there's a very good <laughs> Scottish joke, which is two um, taxis collided in Aberdeen, 35 people in you. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Now, if you tell that joke about <laughs> Cambodians, oh, yeah, do you see yeah. what I mean? Or if you say man walks into a bar and he says the barman, uh, um, if you heard the latest Irish story and the barman says, hey, she's born here, I'm Irish himself. He says, all right, I'll tell it slowly. <laughs> <laughs> if you now say a man walks into a bar, right, and says, and have you heard the latest joke about stupid people? And the barman says, I should tell you I'm very stupid. And he says, all right, I'll tell it slowly. <laughs> it doesn't yeah. work. You've yeah, got to have right. stereotypes. The humor doesn't mean you take them seriously. Right. Well, Except the, with the French. <laughs> there is a race to see who could be most uptight about everything. Uh, and, and it's, it's like the definition of the Scottish Presbyterian. You know this? No. It's a man who has a nasty suspicion that somebody somewhere is enjoying themselves. <laughs> right? <laughs> There is a sort of thing about a party yeah. where the like I these other people can't have fun that I can't enjoy, so I'm yeah, going to stop yeah, the party. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Now, you can't laugh at that because I I didn't find it funny. Not only do I not find it funny, you shouldn't find it funny. That's right. And that's just another. Shall I tell you something, Rob? Whenever you're performing live on stage, if there's one person in the audience, <laughs> I am always <laughs> in the. F Front row, right? But why, why do I? Why do we focus on that guy? Because and and then and now the people that are laughing. Because that's the way we are. We want him to laugh, and it yeah. becomes a personal battle. <laughs> there was a guy to try and get a smile out of the. <laughs> there was a, a sold-out show in Boston at the beautiful Wilbur Theater, and I had a couple of comedians, and we all performed, uh, and they uh, they went on before me, and they said, uh, "Yeah, the great audience. There's a guy in the front row, not smiling at all." <laughs> and then the second guy, you know. He was, uh, so how, uh, how was it? Oh, they're great. There's a guy in the front row. He's not smiling at all. And so, and I went out, and um, and of course my eye goes right to him. Yeah, and yeah. he was he paid a lot, you know, a good amount of money to come see the show. But he wasn't a laugher. The only thing he would give me was this. He went like, <laughs> that's as far as he could go. One was driving me mad in a in a performance, and I I went up to him just at the end of the first half. I said. Why don't you leave now? Yeah. He said, what? I said, you're having a terrible time. <laughs> I don't want to give you a terrible time. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll refund the ticket and you can go and have a nice rest. <laughs> <laughs> and he stayed. Yeah. Well, did he, did he laugh more? Or, or sometimes people I think, don't well, laugh Well, then he outwardly. tried to smile a bit because it wasn't aggressive. Yeah. It was just he didn't think anything was funny. And the strange thing is when I put, show a clip... Yeah. There's a bit of light coming from the screen. You can look at the people in the first three rows. And yeah. What is so surprising is how different their reaction are. Yeah. There's always some people really laughing. Some are laughing a bit. Some are laughing slightly. <laughs> right. You know? There are one or two people smiling, and then there's always that one person. <laughs> <laughs> but it's lovely. It's lovely to, that there's what people decide to laugh out loud. And it, what inf, what it, it's lovely that it influences them, what somebody else is laughing at. Yeah. It's a lovely yes. community thing. Well, that's thing. why I think people always think that the response is uh, more, um, what's the word, uh, predictable yeah. than you think. But really watching the front row, you realize how different they are. But I it's began different. to realize how important laughing is in the last few years. And I'll tell you why, because I did a, a film festival in Sarajevo no, for four years. Sarajevo had Serbian people up in there oh, yeah. uh, lobbing shells in on this city. Snipers. And snipers up there shooting people crossing yeah. the street. Four years. Yeah. And the EU did nothing. And 
it was very touching when I was there. They were telling me about it. And then they, I said, how did you manage? And they told me an extraordinary thing. They said, well, we found an underground uh, uh, car park and we converted it into a cinema. And we showed comedy films. Really? He said, yeah, a lot of Monty Python, because they love it, yeah. the Bosnian. And they said, what was extraordinary was that after we'd been there and laughed for an hour and a half, we came out and we felt better. Nothing had changed. Yeah. It was as awful as it had been when they'd gone in, but they felt better. And there's something about laughter that has this wonderful effect of moving people to a sort of more positive part of their mind. They have, absolutely. Laughter gives you the potential to reset. Ah. So you can come back to this place of not, and, and then you can decide what you get upset about and what you want, what you're gonna choose to let bother you. It comes so, and, and people, one of the interesting things about it, you'd say humanity and individualism of the, of the uh, of everyone, you ask them, are you a good cook? And some will say, well, you know, maybe, not really, or sometimes I cook, I have one good thing. You ask somebody, do you play piano well? Well, you know, I can, uh, a little bit, but not really, I don't play at all. But he said, do you have a good sense of humor? I have an amazing <laughs> sense of humor. Of course I have the best sense of humor. I have a good, but not everybody clearly has a good sense of humor. So there is wow. that identification. But it's but very sad that they don't because they're missing a whole aspect of life. But sometimes it can come to them. That's why sometimes you in your life, so? you don't have a sense of humor, and sometimes you can come back. And, and there's sometimes that people are so traumatized that they can't get there. But humor, if they, ha that's why the audience, coming back to what we talked about, the audience has to do their job. They have to be willing to come as well. Yeah, that's and if true. they do, that's then true. they can have to get out of themselves for a while. And that's what, it's the greatest thing is when you can, you leave a movie or something, and you forget who you are, or where you are, what yeah. country you're in, or what, and just for that moment, because you got to escape. And yeah. escaping with laughter is the best escape, you know. I suddenly realized about 10 years ago that making people laugh is kind of doing more than just making them laugh. Because when people say, you know, the, you do a Comic Con or something like that, and people say, thanks yeah. for making me laugh all these years, 70 year olds, there's a tear. Yeah. You know, and women say something different. They say, thanks for helping to form my sense of humor, which is beautiful. lovely, beautiful. Yeah, but you did, you did with me. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, and then some others say, thank you for helping me through some of the difficult periods. Yeah. And you suddenly realize that if people laugh, it helps. It's not just entertainment. It is a form, it is a form of hugging a genuine form of hugging mm. without touching, because you, you have that connection with the other person laughing. The beautiful thing is, and I'm sure this has happened to you, was when somebody comes up and you said, well, my mother and I watched that movie and we, we shared those laughter and I'll never forget that. And now my mom is gone. And it was like, oh. whoa, that's the part that like, when people tell you that that a beautiful special experience that they went through together is, is amazing. Because all our intention was just to make them laugh. That's right, and Tom Stoppard, uh... Yeah. Great playwright. He said a beautiful thing. He said, the shortest distance between two people is a laugh. Oh, that's beautiful. Isn't that lovely? Yeah, that's perfect.
next time on the Dinosaur Hour. <laughs> <laughs> I'd never heard a bomb go off before I went to Belfast. I could hardly spell Kalashnikov. <laughs> I didn't know what, what that word meant. And here was I thrown into this situation. We were one of the most, possibly the most progressive, racially tolerant countries in the world. One other question. Will you shut up? Yes. <laughs> You can ask me anything. I've always wanted to say that to someone. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Join us, Tom and Emily, to find out what's happening in the heart of Westminster and why it matters to you. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And from your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. GB News. Britain's news channel.